Blue Boy with Grave Fishing. Hey there, friends. I'm Nuclear Yuki, and welcome to another episode of A Nuclear Reading Show. Today, we're continuing on with KCAT's Fallout Equestria. If you're enjoying what I'm bringing to the cold, dark wasteland, don't be afraid to tell your friends about me, or find me on Twitter as Nuclear Yuki. It's a big help. And since the gangs can be a bit feisty, Fallout is owned by Bethesda, and Hasbro made My Little Pony French of His Magic. With all that said and done, welcome, friends, to the Wasteland. Chapter 44, Galvanize, Part 2. Yesterday, breakfast at Spike's table. Spike didn't have any tables for ponies, so we were all gathered on the floor, eating breakfast thoughtfully procured by Lionheart late in the night. I wasn't sure where he acquired the rather large bundle of food, which included fresh hay, vegetables and flowers, but I had my suspicions, and I wasn't about to ask. The majority of Spike's guests had travelled a long and often dangerous way to get to the top of the mountain, and most of us had been suffering various levels of exhaustion from the night before. So shortly after the scene between the Grim Feathers, and with promises of long, important discussions and plans the following morning, almost everyone had slowly found themselves a place to drift to sleep. Now much better rested, and with the company of friends and heroes, those around me were taking to the morning meal with a lively energy. Calamity was in particularly good spirits. After Velvet and Lifebloom's attentions and a good night's rest, his wing had finally regained enough strength to allow him to fly. Not well, and not fast, but he was hovering everywhere like a pro. This world is way too filled with morning people, Gloom mumbled, her mane dropping over her face, but not far enough to conceal her scowl. What are you bringing to the fight? The Amber Mare asked Gloom with a level of enthusiasm that clearly did not sit well with the odd zebra. Before you get too ahead of yourself, her khaki-coated friend cautioned, we don't even know if there will be a fight. The Amber Mare rolled her eyes. Of course there's going to be a fight. It's not like they've planned to just give the Enclave a good talking to. Shifting back to Gloom. So you were a sniper? A medical pwn... Uh, zebra. Fight with your hooves like Zenith. Isn't she awesome? If we are fighting, then I will fight, Gloom answered gravely, with blade and poison, and with my life until they kill me, then probably rise up as a vengeful spirit and haunt whoever's left. The Amber Mare raised an eyebrow, scooting slightly away. All righty then. If this is a battle, Gordonia said, sitting just a little ways away from me, then my talons have much to lend to the fight. Knowing Gord... The word lend was meant literally. We've been collecting a significant amount of resources and tools over these last few weeks. Yeah, that orb vault turns out to be the ultimate treasure map. Butcher, who is now Blackwing's second in command, revealed, ignoring a displeased look from Gord. Last week, we were able to break into an old zebra vault and get at its armory. Check out some of the exotic new weapons we found sealed up in that place. Butcher showed off some of the Talon's new equipment proudly. This nasty little melee number is something the Zebra's called a chainsaw, Butcher announced. Never going to be a replacement for little Gilda, of course, but damn. After rolling her eyes, Blackwing also chose to ignore Gord's displeasure, showing off the new addition to her own arsenal. Zenith identified the strange weapon immediately. A crossbow, she intoned. An assassin's weapon, silent and deadly. Like a fart, Reggie snarked. Then suddenly her eyes lit up and she turned towards her mother. Gordnia pinched the bridge of her beak with her talons. Her eyes scrounged shut. No. No what? Reggie protested. I haven't. No. Gord reiterated. I ain't letting you have a crossbow so you can name it the fart. Reggie whined. But, Mum! I felt myself blush as I was suddenly reminded that the gunslinging griffin hero was indeed just an adolescent. I refocused on eating my flowers. Good flowers. Yeah pretty and tasty. Just found an underground research facility where ponies were attempting to apply zebra alchemical techniques to coal, Blackwing was telling Calamity. It seems they were hoping to create everlasting coal. I never succeeded, but they did manage to produce an alchemically treated coal that burns twice as fast and about ten times as hot. Word of warning, Gordonia said, leaning over to me. If you ever think of having kids, beware. No matter how much you love them, eventually they'll become teenagers. Next to me, Calamity snorted. I merely stammered, thrown a bit. 
Uh, no. Children, not really in the plans. I mean, even if there was time, and even if Amage was here, it wasn't like either of us was going to get the other pregnant. In fact, I was pretty sure pregnancy was right out with any pony I'd ever fancied. Or Griffin, and... Oh, aren't these flowers delicious? Yes, stare at my plate. Munch, munch, munch. Yay for breakfast! Oh, wow. Gloom sing-songed. Little Pip likes mess. You can tell. I nearly choked. What? Why do you say that? I wasn't doing anything. My eyes shifted back and forth as I thought quickly. I was not checking out Gordnia or her daughter or any mare. I'd made certain of it. You were eating flowers, the strange zebra pointed out. So? Zephyr butted in. Gloom, I eat flowers. You eat flowers. But it was the lesbian way she was eating the flowers. What? That, Zephyr informed her, makes no sense. Turning to me, Zenith's daughter advised, Don't listen to her, little pip. Gloom is strange. I nodded, unable to find my voice. A flower petal clinging to my lower lip. Zenith's exotic voice whispered behind me, If you look at my daughter, I will paralyze you. Gah! I wouldn't, never. But it didn't help that I sometimes sneaked a glance at Zenith herself. I found myself blushing almost painfully as Amarja's tease about a threesome replayed in my forebrain. I spun around, but Zenith wasn't there anymore. So instead, I sunk low and tried to focus on anything but mares of any species. Or flowers. Other conversations were continuing all around me. In a far corner, I saw Ditsy Do engaged in a deep-looking discussion with Bark and Saw. You want to know now? Bark and Saw asked. What kind of buck is this? The ghoul peg as I scrubbed off our chalkboard and scribbled something in response. My ears caught a plaintive draconic rumble on the other side of the chamber. Mummy! Pylite had flown up to Spike's eye level. The pink-filled mouse ball clutched in her talons. The huge purple and green dragon was staring at the little rodent inside with a wrenching mix of emotions. You're not mummy, he complained. You can't be! He reached out and gingerly touched the pet ball with a claw tip. Pylite nodded sagely. The mouse simply squeaked. What's that, a big plants? Calamity was asking Gord. I'd missed a shift in the conversation, but I didn't care. I clung to the new discussion like a life preserver. Well, with Shattered Hoof under my wing, and the community you seem so intent on building around it, I've been thinking maybe it's time to hang up my holster. Gordonier admitted. Mercenary work is a young griffin's game. She looked over at her daughter and the empty space next to her that Cage would have naturally filled. I've accomplished more while running the talons than I ever did in the field. I'd have to be blinded in both eyes to not see the opportunity to build something lasting here, she added, and to turn a handsome profit in the process. My ears perked up. I blushed quickly receding. This had become interesting. I felt a spark of hope born of Gordon's words. It doesn't take a tactical genius to realize that the Enclave is building up for a huge battle in Philadelphia sometime very soon, Gordonia pointed out. And I'd be willing to gamble that the timing of this powwow isn't unrelated. So here's the deal. I'm offering the full support of my talent and our resources, but in return, I want total freedom to take over Red Eye's resources in Philadelphia. You say what now? Calamity asked as I fought to pick my jaw up off the floor. Cooperation would be appreciated. Gordonia said. But in the very least, you and your allies don't get in my way, and that includes the Applejack's Rangers. What exactly are you planning? I asked. Expand on what y'all have been pushing me to do, Gord claimed. The area around Shattered Hoover and Junction R7 is becoming a civilization. We're gaining a population, an orchard, a water talisman, everything we need to become one of the biggest thriving communities in the wasteland. Well... Yes, I had kind of been thinking along those lines, I had to admit. So, why stop there? Gord asked. By taking over Red Eye's factories, we could seriously have a shot at rebuilding a real new Equestria. Not that Unity crap. With Shattered Hope as its new Cantalot. I blinked. Well, Gord's plan was definitely ambitious. Still. I'd love to see you take over Red Eye's operations, but only so long as you don't run them the way Red Eye did. Through barbarism and slavery. Gord waved a wing. Settle your mind, little pip. I ain't looking to become the new Red Eye. Wasteland's seen enough of that kind of thinking. I felt myself let go of a tension I hadn't realized was building in me. A new Equestria? I pondered the idea. 
a new Cantalot. But then who would be the new princess? You, Calamity asked. And guard we trust? Gordonia Grimfeathers shook her head. Monarchies are a pony thing. I'm looking for something more inclusive, more open to other people. She looked at her daughter, warming to the topic. A republic, perhaps, fashioned in the image of the legendary Griffin Clan Council. No, princess, I said again, still trying to wrap my brain around the idea. Not even an overmare? Nope, Reggie said. Just an arbiter, for when the heads of the clans can't agree. Mother would be perfect for that. We don't play politics, and we don't take sides. A crooked grin spread across Gord's beak. To be honest, I've already sent representatives to the buffalo, and I was hoping Zenith might serve as an intermediary with the angels. Me? Zenith peeped, seeming once again to appear from nowhere. She seemed about to protest, but stopped, looking confused. Angels? I'd heard that name before, just recently in fact. That would be us, Zephyr called out, apparently having been listening in. Either that or the name caught her attention. After we started making Dash like you taught us, the others decided we needed a new tribe name. We could not use Dads anymore. Zenith's eyes widened. They wanted to name us something fierce, a name that would demand respect, Zephyr claimed. So I thought, since we're living beneath a giant doom bunny, why not name ourselves after him? You named the new tribe after Doom Bunny? Zenith looked pale, which was quite the feat for a zebra. I didn't even know the buffalo still existed, Calamity whispered to me. Velvet Remedy chimed in. Not everything Red Eye was trying to do was bad, she claimed. I too would like to take charge of part of Red Eye's work. Gord scowled, opening her beak to protest, but closed it when Velvet Remedy said, His plans for schools and medical centers. Y'all are dividing up something that ain't ours, Calamity warned the two of them. I was mostly interested in the factories, Gord admitted. But I have the talons and the X-Raiders of Shattered Hoof to help. No offense, but how is one pony going to build schools and bring education and medicine to all of the wastelands? I? Velvet Remedy blushed uncertainly. I think I have alicorns. Gord blinked. Zenith scooted closer to Velvet. If you do this, would you please make a start in Glyphmark? Glyphmark needs a school and a medical center. She looked over at Zephyr. It has a doctor and... Zenith looked back at Velvet Remedy, her face hardened with determination. I have decided. I wish to become their teacher. This is something I can do for them. Velvet's eyes widened, as did her smile. She moved to hug Zenith, but the zebra had anticipated this and swiftly tapped the ground. I heard something break and the zebra vanished in a puff of unhuggable smoke. Velvet plopped back down, looking shocked for a good ten seconds before recovering. You're right, Gordonia. She finally said, Even if I do have alicorns, I will still need help. So, I'll make you a deal. The griffin raised an eyebrow in response, all ears. Velvet offered, You help me do this, and in honor of Cage, I'll use the name he came up with. I'll name the Philadelphia School after him. Uh? Glamour tried to caution, and then seemed to give up. Leaning towards me, he muttered, I really hope your plan involves defeating both the Enclaves and Red Eyes armies in Philadelphia. He looked at Gordon Velvet Remedy uneasily. The name Cage came up with? Gord asked, confused. She looked at her daughter questioningly. The followers of the apocalypse. Today. Walking on clouds was weird. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to truly get over my discomfort. I just had to accept the general wrongness of it and press on. Are you sure about splitting up like this? Calamity yelled over the driving wind and the sound of the defense array. Above us, Spike was wheeling and dancing, trying to keep away from the blast and the defense cannons by placing the attacking rappers between himself and the base. Don't worry about me, Velvet called back, smiling. This old unicorn still got a few tricks. Old unicorn? Calamity called back. Where? Had him behind Velvet? A cacophony of rending metal and explosions marked the second raptor to be taken out by friendly fire. Fortunately, the Enclave soldiers left to operate the defense array were proving too novice to skillfully avoid their own ships and still hit Spike. Unfortunately, a few of their shots were indeed hitting Spike, and his cover was dwindling. We need to go! I called back to the two of them before charging off. You better be okay when I find you again, Calamity told Velvet sternly. 
The beautiful unicorn smiled and shook her head. Of course I will. They'll come for you, Calamity said, not for the first time. Let them, Velvet replied. They'll underestimate me. Everyone underestimates me. Calamity and Velvet paused, looking into each other's eyes, embraced in a passionate kiss. A minute later, they broke apart. Velvet galloped off in a second direction, and Calamity in a third. Yesterday. I'm sorry I'm late. The most wonderful voice in Equestria apologised. Did I miss the briefing? Amarja's voice brightened the room, lifting my spirits. It was as if my heart was being held aloft by a flock of butterflies. Nope, Calamity said to the sprite bot that the voice of my love was coming from. We were just about to start. Glad you could make it. Oh, thank you. I gushed at Spike. My eyes began to tear in joy. I was going to have one last time with Amarge. Maybe not physically, but this was still more than I had hoped. He stroked his spines back, looking a little embarrassed at the volume of emotion I was pouring out. You're welcome. Everyone else in the cave was staring. It was nothing, really. Oh, but it isn't nothing. I insisted. It's everything. I couldn't help it. I threw myself around one of his ankles. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you start kissing Spike, Amarge said, her voice sparkling with amusement. I'm leaving the room. I stopped, my eyes turning to the crowd, a blush rising. Oh, uh, little Pip, y'all were saying about how the egg leg depends on the cloud curtain. Calamity reminded me tactfully. You know, the plan? Uh, oh, yes, that. I pulled myself back up, brushed my mane out of my face, and stared back at all the eyes turned towards me. This was it. This was the plan. Still, the pony in my head wouldn't stop bouncing around like Pinkie Pie, cheering Spike and crying out Amarja's name. The Enclave will annihilate every living soul in Philadelphia and bury the industrial progress made there under melted rubble if they aren't stopped, I reminded them. If Red Eye's forces win, the surviving Pegasi will end up enslaved or with their heads on pikes. And Stern's talents aren't likely to stop with just one successful victory, Gord added. With Red Eye gone... She'll be looking to take over his whole operation. Defeating the Enclave's biggest force, she'll take the war back to the clouds once she smells weakness. This is the griffin who wiped out Father's tribe, isn't it? Zephyr asked. Zenith scowled, nodding affirmatively. Well, then they can't win, the younger Zebra insisted. Do we have any idea when the Enclave are going to attack? One of the Applejack's rangers asked. Yes, I told him. Tomorrow morning. The news was greeted by several voices of dismay. It'll be the largest, fiercest battle Equestria has endured since the Great War, I reiterated. And unfortunately, I'm going to miss it. What? The sound was a chorus. We have a chance to end things, I told them. Not just one battle, but the entire threat of the Enclave entirely. Forever. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to lead a group into the Enclave's military base in Navarro, break into the single Pegasus project, and tear down the Cloud Curtain. Wait... Morning Frost said, tossing up a hoof. You're going to take on Navarro. I was stationed there, you know. Biggest military base we've... they've got. Do you know how many troops they're stationed there? How about the Thunderhead and the Raptors? The shield? The defense array? The Enclave brought the war down to us! Lionheart announced, sending Silverbell as deep as she could get beneath Dinsey Doo's wing. We are bringing it back up to them! Most of the troops won't be at Navarro, I claimed. We have two advantages going in. First is the element of surprise. The Enclave isn't expecting forces from below to actually attack them on their home, uh, turf. There had to be a Pegasi-appropriate word for that. I pushed forward. This will be an unexpected tactic. Y'all yeah, can say that again. Second is the fact that tomorrow morning, Navarro will be functioning on a skeleton crew. I revealed. Every available Pegasi from Navarro has been used to bolster the military force poised to hit Philadelphia. Until the battle is over, there'll be almost no pony left at the base. I looked to Gord. This is the information Cage gave his life for. The one opportunity. The one window of weakness that we can exploit to take over the SVP and kill the Enclave for good. Gord near Grimfeathers drank that in without comment. Once inside the SVP shield, it might take hours to figure the place out. We can't count on what I'm going to do in there happening in time to save the people of Philadelphia. So, I need your help. Most of you. In the battle for Philadelphia. I told them. I have a plan. 
But look, what I'm about to ask of you all is more than any pony has the right to ever ask of anyone. But for the sake of every pony else in this room and everyone out there, both below and above the clouds, I'm asking. No, I'm begging you to help. We wouldn't be here if we hadn't already said yes, kid. One of the Applejack's rangers announced. Get on with it. There were whinnies of support all around the cave. I took a deep breath, and with that, I laid it out, starting with the part I felt worst about. Ditsy do, I said solemnly, focusing on the ghoul Pegasus. She was listening in from the back, one wing wrapped around her adopted daughter. I hate this more than anything, but I need to put you right in the heart of the battle. My heart seized as Silverbelt's eyes went wide. Mummy? She asked timidly. Focusing myself forward, I told her, I need you to perform another Sonic Rad Boom, this time right in the middle of the conflict. I quickly added, But I want you to do so with as little risk as possible. If you could take out some of the Enclave's ships, that's wonderful, but the goal is to clear the clouds over the battle zone. So if you can pull it off at a higher altitude, keep yourself out of the firefights, that would be best. Silverbell was looking at her mother with a painful expression. But who will catch you? Lionheart will, I managed, looking towards the Royal Cantalot Ghoul. I'm sending you and Mouse into Philadelphia. Your mission is to wreak as much havoc amongst the Enclave as possible, keeping their focus off Ditsy Do, and to catch her if she needs it. Once the Sonic Rad Boom happens, I want all three of you out of the area as swiftly as possible. I had to admit, I was feeling a lot better about sending Ditsy Do to Philadelphia than I had in the days before, now that we had Lion and Mouse. But for now... I need you to get Ditsy Doo to the Philadelphia Crater. To Ditsy. Wait there until it's time. No pony should bother you in there, and you should be glowing again in no time. I hated this, but there was no other way. Looking at the lovable ghoul Pegasus, I whispered to myself, We can't lose you. I realized I was banking an awful lot on Ditsy Doo being able to explode twice. Ditsy Doo gave a cute little salute, and then turned to Silver Bell writing something on her chalkboard. The little filly nodded, embracing her new mother in a teary farewell. I sent all my prayers to Celestia and Luna that they would only be apart for a day. Velvet Remedy wrapped her tail around Silverbell as Lionheart trotted up to her. The little pink ball wheeled across the room in their wake as the two ghouls walked out of the cave. Hold on, I called to them, and the two ghouls stopped, looking over their shoulders. The little ball smacked into Ditsidoo's left hind leg and rebounded with a squeak. Before you go... I'll need to speak to Ditsy Doo in private. I need them just to wait a little longer. Don't worry, it won't be long. Ditsy Doo nodded patiently and sat down. Silverbell pushed herself free of Velvet's tail and scurried over to be with her wall-eyed mother. I swallowed and steeled myself for the rest. One of the worst parts was over. God, I need you and your talons to clear the sky over Ten Pony Tower and keep it that way. Reggie protested. We're not going to be in the battle. Hopefully not, I thought in response. You're critical to it, is what I told her. She didn't seem particularly mollified. And what are you offering in return? Gord asked. A few of the ponies around us murmured unpleasantly, but I knew Gord wasn't trying to squeeze me in a time of crisis. She just needed an offering, if only a token once, to save face. After all, the Talons weren't crusaders. They were a business. How about an opportunity to expand your influence into Tempori Tower? I offered. I own what used to be a cheese shop. Perfect place for God's talons or new cantalot to set up a satellite office. Homage's voice rang over the sprite bot, sounding slightly tinny. Oh, little Pip, what are you planning? From her tone, she already knew. Life bloom. I turned to the one member of the Twilight Society that we had with us. You're going to have to convince your friends in Tempori Tower, once the clouds are cleared in both places... We need the Twilight Society to bring the power of Celestia 1 down on that battlefield. Lifebloom blinked slowly, and then nodded. You can count on me, he added. On us. What Celestia 1? One of the Wasteland Crusaders asked, and Lifebloom explained, leaving out the finer details. But the reality was quickly clear. Tempony Tower had the ability to enact a megaspell capable of tactical precision, and I was going to unleash it against both sides. We're taking back what they stole from us, the Amber Crusader said in awe, and then using it as a weapon against them. Yes. I let myself smile just a little at the wonder in her voice before continuing. Meanwhile, 
a group of us will be hitting Navarro. And once we get to the heart of it, the SVP Central Hub, I'm going inside. I'll be analyzing Cloud Curtain and then using the towers to tear away as much of it as I can without threatening the Pegasi with starvation. Morning Frost and Sunglint objected. I shared a glance with Spike before confiding, There is a final step to this plan, one that will compensate for the loss of crops, but that's going to take extra time to implement, possibly months, but we do have that covered. I looked at Morning Frost. You were stationed at Navarro. Why don't you and Calamity give us an overview of what we're attacking? Morning Frost floated up her pit buck and brought up a map of Navarro from its database. Velvet Remedy concentrated, her horn lighting up. The illusionary magic she had previously used for concert light shows now trained on presenting a mirage of Navarro that everyone could see. It looked like a cloud bisected egg. The small red alicorn shield of the SPP central hub at the core. The blue enclave energy field surrounding the base like a shell. We could make out several clusters of buildings including the barracks, the science center, and even a collection of solar dishes like those outside of Hope. The base got its power from a combination of those dishes and a field of thunderclouds. The former largely powering the blue dome and the defense array. Navarro was set into a higher patch of clouds than the cloud curtain itself. Between the two, the ominous bulk of the Thunderhead Victorious stalked the sky, barely moving. The Victorious's four raptors prowled about it. And that's our target, Paladin Strawberry Knight surmised. We're here to help you take on that? She sounded impressed and a little confused. How? We can't fly. Yeah! The Amber Mare jumped up. How can we help? The Wasteland Crusaders are ready! Her two friends whinnied their affirmations. I had no answer for them. I honestly hadn't intended for them to be here. Pylite gave a little hoot and swooped down to whistle into Velvet Remedy's ear. Her eyes brightened. Maybe you could, Velvet Remedy suggested. Well, not fly exactly, but spike. She shifted her attention to the dragon. Did you tell us that Twilight Sparkle had a cloud-walking spell? Would there be any chance that that spell is somewhere in all these books? I'd forgotten about that. With a thrill, I realized that the cloud-walking spell should also allow me to hack into the Enclave computers. It wouldn't help me with their locks, since it wouldn't alter my telekinesis or my tools, but this was still a huge improvement. Spike coughed, then puffed up proudly. Hey! I was the number one assistant of the nerdiest unicorn in all of Equestria. Have you seen this library? Wonderful. Lifeloom jumped up with a grin. Point the way. If you've got it, I can learn it. Velvet already cocked her head, staring at him. With a playfully put out voice, she asked, Really? Is there any spell you can't learn? Not so far, he admitted. Spike looked over the white unicorn curiously. How is that? Is your special talent... Is it magic? Lifebloom laughed and shook his head, his crimson and scarlet curls quivering. Oh, no, no, no. I'm nowhere near as powerful as even Little Pip, much less a pony like Twilight Sparkle. Powerful? Me? Since when? But I am exceptionally versatile. Turns out that's my special gift. Learning. Blushing a little, he confessed. I can learn pretty much anything I set my mind to if I have the resources. He could have learned anything and he chose to become a medical pony. A healer? Wow, I hadn't even... Wait, idea. Spike, do you by any miracle have the Ministry of Magic's research into spell in the box? I think so, the dragon said. After the briefing, I'll see if I can't find it. Zenith spoke up gently. And I can craft some bloodwing talismans, she offered. But I will not be joining you in this fight, little pip. Calamity, Velvet, and I all turned towards our zebra friend in surprise. Zenith shook her head solemnly. My place is in Philadelphia. Stern murdered my husband and destroyed our tribe, she reminded us, no longer trying to hide who she was from Zephyr. Enslaved me and thrust my fall out into the cold, brutal wasteland without protection. If this battle is going to be the end of Stern, then I must be there. I nodded, frowning a little but accepting that completely. Zenith was right. This was her story to play out, no matter how much I might wish her by my side. Now remember, folks, Calamity spoke up, stopping a hoof for attention before flying into the center of the room above the floating image of Navarro. These soldiers ain't the bad guys. They're the enemy, only that they'll be shooting at us, and it ain't like we ain't invading their home. He stared out over the assembled ponies and others. These soldiers ain't done nothing wrong. Many of them will be fresh recruits still being trained. 
They ain't done nothing to harm Equestria or its people. The ones who have, they're all going to be in Philadelphia. And the pony in charge, he choked a little. Colonel Autumn Leaf, the one who ordered the Friendship City Massacre and almost every other atrocity, he's dead, folks. We ain't going into Navarro looking for blood. We kill only in self-defense. Calamity's words were forceful and brokered no argument. We ain't going into slaughter. We're just punching a hole. Another reason I didn't want Lionheart involved in Navarro. And now came the other hard part. I turned to Strawberry Lemonade and the eleven other Applejack's rangers. And to answer your previous question, no. You're not going to be part of the assault on Navarro. Philadelphia, then? Again, I shook my head. You're going to be here. Here? Strawberry Lemonade asked, sounding disappointed. Here? Spike blurted. I nodded. Yes, here. Right here in this cave. I looked up to Spike. The group of you are going to defend this cave and its extremely important secrets from anyone who might take the opportunity to attack while Spike's gone. Gone? Spike repeated in disbelief. Yes. I told him. We need you with us. We can't do this without you, Spike. It's time to stop watching. He looked between me and the Applejack's rangers. But... What would Twilight Sparkle have done? I asked. From his expression, I didn't need to say any more. Wait, Calamity said. You're sending Spark into battle against the Victorious and Four Raptors? Doesn't the Enclave call those dragon killers? Spike chuckled wryly. I guess this was preordained. To be honest, I always found that name insulting. He made a wave with his claws. Part of me always wanted to put them in their place for that. Morning Frost looked at Velvet Remedy's illusion of Navarro, and then stared up at Spike. Do you think you can take down the Enclave Shield? Spike lowered his head, staring at the data on her pit buck. Magically enhanced Type 6 photonic resonance barrier. Let me do the math. Assistant to the most geeky unicorn indeed. He sat up, making an elaborate show of counting on his claws, occasionally mumbling something like, Carry the three before leaning back and giving us a wide, dangerous, sharp-tooth-filled grin. Oh, yeah, he purred. Probability of hindrance, zero percent. I couldn't help but grin. And you three, I said, turning to the Wasteland Crusaders. I want you here, helping protect this place, just in case. And what are the chances of someone attacking this cave in the few hours you were gone? The olive-coated buck asked. Hopefully none. I prayed. But while I can't explain why, this cave is the single most important place in Equestria, and it must be protected at all costs. Paladin Strawberry Lemonade shook off our disappointment and stepped up. Then we will guard it with our lives. You can count on Applejack's rangers. None shall pass. Yes. Everything was shaping up better than I could have expected. I'm pretty sure I can't get through the shield around the central hub, though, Spike added cautiously. What are you going to do once you get there? I opened my muzzle and then shut it again. In truth, the whole thing was a gamble. An educated guess, fueled as much by faith as fact. I'm going to do what I do best, I told him simply. Drop something heavy on it? Calamity asked. Get shot full of holes, Velvet Remedy offered Riley. Stare at flanks? Reggie snarked. The voice of Amage floated out of the sprite bot. Orgasm? Hey, homage! My ears and cheeks burned like Celestia's sun. When had I fallen onto the floor and why were my legs twitching like that? Scribbling swiftly, Ditsy Doo offered up, squeak and blush. I could hear the giggles. Ah, okay, fine, I whimpered, giving up. I'm just going to do something I'm sort of good at. I sighed, covering my face. God, what I have to deal with? Hey! Leave me out of this one, kid. Today. Velvet Remedy was the first to reach her destination. The Enclave broadcast station from where the Enclave was tied into the radio override system of the SPP. I'm sorry, she sang out. Pardon me, excuse me. As she dropped each of the technicians in turn with her anaesthetic spell, she turned around and propped the doors open wide behind her, and then proceeded to look over the controls. Now, if I were a shut-everything-down button, where would I be? She glanced up as the propped-open doors swung shut again, and went back to her work. Aha! 
With a jab of her hoof, the ROS began to reboot. Within two minutes, the overriding Enclave broadcast was back on the air. Velvet Remedy trotted over to a microphone, checking the settings on the soundboard, and then cleared her throat. Hello, equestrians, and good morning, she said sweetly. Now, I know I'm not DJ Pwn3, but I am a good friend, and I'm sure she... sure he wouldn't mind if I entertained you all for a while. I have some wonderful new music that I wrote myself, but first let me tell you a little about what's going on in the wasteland today. The doors to the station banged open, half a dozen Enclave soldiers bursting in. Without skipping a beat, Velvet purred, starting with the young bucks and mares of the Enclave who just came in to shut me down. She waved at them with her tail. Pull up a place, boys. Let me play some real music for you. Back away from the controls, lady, one of the Enclave soldiers ordered. Surrender. You're unarmed. And if I see your horns start to glow, we all shoot. Don't make us kill you. Velvet Remedy looked put out, pouting with her lower lip and fluttering her eyes. But boys, I don't need guns or magic. I have something with me that's much more powerful than those. Velvet smiled pleasantly. Kindness. The Enclave soldiers looked out at each other. One of them started to laugh. Kindness? What the hell kind of weapon is that? There was a flash in the centre of the room. Within the flash appeared a purple alicorn, her horn glowing. Her hooves ringed with all the ammunition and power packs on the Enclave soldier's magical armour. The air shimmered behind the talkative one, revealing a midnight blue alicorn with a silky, frost-coloured mane. The oddly maned alicorn leaned close and whispered, The kind that earns you friends. Yesterday. They need to see, I told Spike after the mission briefing had broken up. I expected resistance. Instead, Spike agreed readily. I've already shown Ditsy do, he confessed. As one of the spirits of the elements of harmony, she deserved to know. One of the what now? Calamity questioned. He and Velvet Remedy were standing with me, along with Spike, Ditsy do, and the floating sprite bot that channeled homage. I opened my muzzle to explain, but Spike suggested we just show them. Ten minutes later, we were standing before the wonder of the Gardens of Equestria the sun shining down through the mountain's natural chimney and glowing off the spine of the Crusader mainframe and its web of cables. The elements of harmony seemed to shine in their glow of Celestia's sun, resting on their pedestals. I explained it all. Everything. Ditsy Doo sat at the pedestal holding the element of laughter, staring reverently at the necklace with the little balloon-shaped gem. Calamity was the first to speak. The spirit of loyalty? He seemed overwhelmed. That's... A lot. I'll try to live up to that. You already do, I assured him. The elements of harmony require many things, Spike reminded him, but they don't require you to be perfect. Kindness? Velvet Remedy sounded faint. But are you sure? She leaned closer to me, speaking hesitantly. In case you haven't noticed, Pip, I can be a bitch sometimes. I thought back to Velvet's kindness to the dying alicorn at Maraponi to her taking a stance against attacking the Hellhounds, to her holding Silverbell back in her barn. It had taken me far too long to recognise who was right in front of me, to see both my friends for who they were. In truth, I should have seen it back in Tempony Tower, when they explained how they felt about each other, both of them expressing what they saw in the other in terms of their own virtues. Yes, I affirmed. I'm sure. But what about Fluttershy? Velvet Remedy pleaded. The dragon answered. The elements of harmony are passed on. Sometimes even while their former bearers are still alive. It happened with Celestia and Luna. You're not taking it from her. This is natural. You mean, even if she comes back? Spike blinked. If who comes back? Celestia? Fluttershy. What? Velvet Remedy explained. We can save Fluttershy. Bring her back. Maybe. It's risky, but... Fluttershy's dead, Spike said, sounding fairly certain. No, Velvet Remedy corrected him. Fluttershy's a tree. Ditsy Doo fluttered over, landing between us. She kicked off her chalkboard and took a piece of chalk in her mouth, scribbling. What's going on? Velvet Remedy thinks Fluttershy's a tree, Spike explained. Ditsy Doo cocked her head, one eye focusing on Velvet, while the other seemed to stare up at Spike. 
She rubbed her hoof on a chalkboard and wrote, Fluttershy was a friend. Ditsy added, You know she was a pony, not a tree, right? She's not a tree, Velvet, Spike insisted. But she is a tree, Velvet Remedy exclaimed. She turned to Calamity and me for support. Aye, yup, Calamity said. Killing joke got her, I explained, affirming, Fluttershy's a tree. It took Spike and Ditsy Doo quite a bit of time to process that. This was some pony they knew, a good friend, particularly to Spike, one of his mares. The idea that she was still alive, that she might even be saved, was a lot to take in. Meanwhile, I had unpleasant news to break to the others. After tomorrow, your top priority will have to be finding the two remaining ponies with the virtues needed to use the elements of harmony and set off the gardens of Equestria. By your estimation, Calamity... You'll have about a year before things get really bad. I hope you can do it by then. Wait. Calamity waved a hoof. Y'all say that like you're not coming with us. My heart felt like it was being squeezed. I'm not, I said, feeling tears. I can't. I explained to them, as I had to life bloom, that the single Pegasus project needed a pony, and that saving Equestria required that pony to stay. Why you? I sighed heavily. Because all of this. I glanced around at the gardens of Equestria. Because, in the end, I'm expendable, and you're not. Not to us, Velvet insisted vehemently. It's okay. I consoled her softly. This is... it's the right thing for me. I smiled, tears dripping down my cheeks. I finally know what my virtue is. It's not fair, she whined. It does not matter that it is unfair. Zenith had once told me. It still is. Zebra wisdom. Velvet Remedy leaned into Calamity and cried. Calamity wrapped a wing around her. I agree with Velvet. You ain't expendable. You're a big damn hero and our dearest friend. He tipped off his hat. Y'all do what you have to do, but take this with you. I want you to have it. Seeing Calamity's gift... Velvet Remedy floated out the Fluttershy orb. And this from me. One year? Spike's head jerked towards us. That's insane. I've been looking for over 200 years. And Lil Pip's on far of us in just under two months. Calamity smiled, looking at Spike with lidded eyes. Perhaps y'all are doing it wrong. Ditty Doo held up her chalkboard. He found Little Pip. Spike spluttered, stared, and slapped his palm across his eyes dragging his hand down his snout, bending it until it slipped from his hand and snapped back with a boing. I've been so stupid! What? I'm so sorry. Spike looked at me apologetically. You're not unimportant, little Pip. You're the most important part. What now? No, I needed to be unimportant. I knew my virtue, and it wasn't any of the ones the Elements of Harmony were looking for. I told you that your group wasn't the one that was needed because it was obvious to me that you and Steelhooves weren't ever going to be bearers. He explained rapidly. But it takes more than just being loyal or honest to be a bearer. Oh crap, you're going to make this more complicated now? It's just like it doesn't require that the bearers be perfect paragons of their virtue. There's more to it than that. He looked at us all. I mean, it's not like the destined few just happened to all live in Ponyville. Fluttershy, Applejack, Rarity. I'm sure there were plenty of ponies with the same virtues, but it wasn't enough to just have the virtues. That wasn't what made them suitable to be bearers. It was only when they accepted the call to act and became friends in the process that they became worthy in the eyes of the elements. The elements have ours now? Calamity questioned, taking it a little too literally. I've seen it before. The elements won't work for ponies who don't possess the right virtues, true or who aren't friends, but they also don't work for ponies who aren't willing to stand up and truly fight against disharmony and evil. They have to fight the good fight. Homage agreed. Spike continued, It was when they all stepped into the Everfree Forest, braving it together, that they truly started to become friends. Well now, Calamity said, I reckon any set of good ponies who are willing to brave danger and face down evil together are likely to become friends. Exactly, Spike agreed. There's a word for accepting that call to action. Galvanize. I was lost. Spike turned to me again. 
I was so fixated on how it happened with Twilight Sparkle that I forgot. But even Nightmare Moon thought the spark didn't work, and she was Luna, who with Celestia had been a former bearer. The only way she wouldn't have known better is if the very nature of the spark changes with time. I began to glean where this was headed, and opened my muzzle to protest, but the dream words of Twilight Sparkle and her friends floated through my mind. It's happening differently this time, isn't it? Well, duh. Do you think it was the same when it was just Celestia? Same is boring. I reckon it's different every time. Last time, it happened inside Twilight. Last time, the spark was an epiphany. This time, the spark is a pony. Spike stared at me. Little Pip, you're the spark. What? But how? A very different kind of spark. Damn, Calamity whinnied. When the five are present, a spark will cause the six to be revealed. As every pony turned to him, he grinned sheepishly. Hey, I was paying attention. I dropped to the floor, my head swimming in cloudy confusion, then suddenly clearing like the pony in my head had performed a sonic rain boom. At that moment, I finally realized what most of you had probably figured out right from the prologue, the true meaning of my cutie mark. A feature not to be forgotten. Pip bucks keep track of the location of tagged objects or people. If a pony somehow got lost, you could help find them. Like I had found the Ministry Mares, their stories, which cried out to be remembered, and through the statuettes created through rarity sacrifice, the Mares themselves. Like I had found Velvet Remedy, even without the aid of a tag, and I had found each of my friends, and a whole lot of good, heroic people, many of whom were gathered in the main room of this very cave. I had gotten my cutie mark when I had found that little foal and reunited him with his parents, the first worthwhile thing I had ever done in my life. My special talent was finding the right people. But this don't mean we still need little Pip, Calamity asked suddenly. We ain't got before. Velvet Remedy answered with a hesitant but conviction-filled, No. She smiled sadly, wiping tears from her eyes. Have you seen the next room? Little Pip has done her part. We know where to start looking. The lovely charcoal-coated unicorn looked up at Amarja's sprite bot. And even if the other two aren't in that room, we know where to look next. We look to each pony who has been galvanized to action, to fight the good fight, by the example of the Lightbringer that DJ Pwn3 has beamed into every corner of Equestria. Today... A spectacular explosion of effervescent purple ripped through the New Hope Solar Array. Now that's how we do it down in the wasteland! Calamity whooped as the defense array fell silent. The rust-colored buck's well-placed explosion had severed both the power connections to the active dishes and to the nighttime reserve batteries as well. Fortunately, he was all but an expert in repairing things, and the knowledge of how to dismantle them came with it. Plus, he'd come with a sack full of explosives looted from the overcast and one special little surprise. Calamity sniffed the air. Well, what do you know? It's like the end of an empire, with radishes. Above, Spike roared, signaling his thanks as he turned to engage the raptor Noctilucent. A blast of yellow light scorched Calamity's mane and burned his right ear, the bulk of the grazing shot hitting the wall behind the solar tower next to him. Calamity spun, searching the air above and the spaces between the solar towers. He had flown into the New Hope Solar Array with several Pegasi on his tail. Practiced in stealth, he was able to lose them long enough to rig the detonation. He had hoped the explosion would keep their attention as he made his escape. He spotted the two Enclave Pegasi as they opened fire again. They weren't power-armored elite fighters, just recruits on guard duty. Calamity dove for cover, darting between the towers. His recently healed wing ached badly, protesting the workout, and his body was beginning to feel the lack of sleep from the night before. If they cornered him, he was dead. Or they were. Most likely the latter. He didn't want to kill these ponies, and that meant running away or hiding. More shots passed above and below him. One struck his armor just above his battle saddle. Damn it. He could just lose the damn pursuit. He spotted a door. It could be a dead end, trapping him, or it could be the perfect place to hide, or even an escape route. Calamity made a snap decision. Dodging and wheeling, he pulled his attackers further away, and then the moment he had some cover, he made a hard loop around for the door. His wings screamed in protest, threatening to fail. Calamity reached the door, 
only to find it was locked. I think he flew back this way, he heard one of the Enclave guards say. God fucking damn it! Calamity heard a heavy barrage of magical energy erupt somewhere overhead. He looked up to see Spike tearing into the plasma cannons of the Raptor Noctilucent. As he watched, one of the smaller guns got off a horrific lucky shot, sending a beam of deadly magical energy right into Spike's right eye. The dragon howled, twisting as he slipped off the raptor and tumbling out of sight. The door behind him opened, a guard pony flying out to sea. Calamity bucked him over the head, knocking him unconscious, and then dragged him back in through the door, closing it behind him. The rust-coloured pony's eyes went wide as he stared at the shells of tiny, glowing alien energy cells, each about a hundredth of the size of the alien battery used in Star Blasters. Above the shells was a placard, reminding the Enclave Pegasi, Remember, you are the first and only line of defense between Equestria and the things that fall from above. Holy shit! Last night. I'm so sorry, I told Amage, my voice trembling. My friends were all off making their own preparations. It was just me and her. Me alone with a sprite bot in a secluded corner of the cave. For what? Amarja's voice was soothing. You did good. I'm sorry for leaving, and because... I thought of all the dead, all those I didn't save back in the Everfree Forest. I'm not good enough. Stop focusing on the few you couldn't save, and remember that they would all have been dead if it weren't for you. Amarja chided. You saved the wasteland from taint, and not just what would have been spilled. By obliterating both Maraponi and Red Eyes Cathedral, you protected Equestria from all of this from happening again. And if you have to count, be sure to count all those ponies whose lives won't be ended in horror or murder because of the evils you've put an end to. I wept. I'm not coming back. I know, she replied, her voice slightly tinny, but still the most beautiful thing in Equestria. I grasped the sprite bot between my four hooves, holding it closer and leaning my forehead against its grill my horn brushing one of the antennas. What's the most important thing I give you, little Pip? I was surprised by the question. It's not the orgasms, is it? She prodded. No! I quickly insisted. It's... I paused, trying to find the words. The solace. Well, Amage told me through the sprite bot. Then I think you are a very silly pony. I blinked back tears. What? You're about to plug yourself into the central control for all the towers. She pointed out. The same towers I use for all my broadcasts. You're not leaving me. Not where it counts. The SBP is what I do. I hadn't thought of it that way. And you'll have access to the entire network. She added. You'll be able to watch over all of the equestrian wasteland. I blinked. The little pony in my head made a quick note to access those records as soon as possible and check in on all of my friends, especially Zenith and Ditsy Doo. I would need to see what happened in the battle for Philadelphia. The central hub should at least have a few recent hours of stored data. You're not going to be losing me at all. We'll be closer than ever. Then, bemusedly, she noted, Although I guess this means I'll need to find a second home. What? I asked softly, still processing the new reality. Some place I can modify the way I want, so I can take my showers outside. Huh? Why would you do that? To enjoy the sunlight? I opened my muzzle to protest. It didn't seem safe. A monster with a radar or a rifle? You know, where you can watch. Thud. From the floor, I whimpered. Have I ever mentioned just how evil you are? Today... Imagine one of the battles won, and we raise our faces to the sun. Velvet Remedy's voice sang, sweet and defiant, in my ear bloom as I galloped down the gleaming white hallways of the Enclave Science Centre. Protected by the field of the MG Stealth Buck 2, she was singing to all of Equestria now, the entire wasteland. Wherever there was a radio, they were hearing her voice. The song was a rousing anthem, something to embolden the spirits of Equestria's fighters, to give them strength. Equestria will live forever. Something to galvanise. I reached the cell block with a few minutes of invisibility to spare. A quick sweep of the area told me all I needed to know. The cell doors had no accessible locks. They were operated entirely from the terminal in the guard office. 
It had a cloud interface. Fortunately, I could do those now. I slipped into the guard room and started hacking while the two guards were busy talking about the attacking dragon. My ears perked when one of them claimed the defence grid had gone down. My heart leapt. Calamity had been successful. Which meant that the albino hellhounds a little lesson in explosives had probably paid off. Maybe it was a good thing I didn't drink that glowing soda after all. I hated to think what that would have done to my insides. The password was invincible. Right. The terminal brought up the door controls as well as a host of guard alerts. Most of them were from the last 20 minutes and had to do with the currently ongoing attack. One of them was not. Disposal Order 34. Fluffykins. I didn't need to read it. I knew what it was. The order was dated to this morning, three hours ago. Assuming the guards here weren't any swifter than they appeared, that meant Fluffykins the Warclaw was still alive and that the Enclave was about to execute her. After all, the Hellhound Control had just been field-tested and battle-tested successfully. They didn't have any need for her anymore. It was with a sense of justice bordering on pleasure that I opened her cell door, and then moments later trotted past, floating a present across the gulf of clouds to the small metal platform she was confined to. A present from a friend! I called out as my invisibility failed. Part of me wanted to linger, if only long enough to see Fluffykins open it and make sure she realised what she could do now. And there was a note with the present, but I wasn't certain Fluffykins could read. But I couldn't do any of that. It was time to run. No looking back. I could only hope that I'd made a difference, that I'd given her a way out that was better for her than what she had been given before. I wanted to do right. Last night. I had a big day ahead of me, and the talk with Amarge had wrung the last energy out of me. I really just wanted to sleep. The party in the main chamber was not cooperating. I could feel the heavy pounding of drums as much as I could hear them, and Velvet Remedy's chocolate sweet vocals swam into my ears. Tonight was the last night before a big battle, one that would define the future of Equestria, and many of them might not be coming back. The party had been Silverbell's idea, naturally, but none of them were going to spend their last night reading a good book. Raise your hoof! Velvet Remedy's voice called out repeatedly, part of the famous Vinyl Scratch and Pinkie Pie duet. I tried to bury my head under a pillow. Apparently, Spike had a lot of pillows. Hey, little Pip! Spike poked his head into the Gardens of Equestria chamber where I had slipped away. Silverbell is starting Pin the Tail on the Pony. Wanna play? I groaned. Wah, deja vu, Spike said. You really should join everyone. It's the last night before, you know. You should spend it with your friends. I groaned again but tossed off the pillow and sat up. Maybe Spike was right. Against my very real wishes, I followed him into the bright, very noisy main chamber and was promptly swept up in the games and festivities. There was pin the tail, pillow fighting and piñatas, toy races and table tennis. A bookshelf had been turned over and used as a snack table, covered in every sort of preservative-laden centuries-old sweet that any pony could get a hoof on, including a huge mound of MOM-approved snack cakes. Velvet Remedy, in all her glory, was belting out one fierce dance tune after another, her horn providing a full musical accompaniment and a dazzling light show. I danced with more ponies and griffins and zebras in one night than I ever imagined I would in a lifetime, and the little pervert in my head got a fair helping of flank staring during the conga line. And there were presents, very special presents crafted by Life Bloom, who had spent most of the day studying up on spell in a box. Cloud walking presents. But most importantly, it was fun. That night, that party, I think it was the most pure fun I had ever enjoyed in my life. Spike had been right. This was better and so much more important than sleep. These were moments of joy with my friends. At the end of the party, Life Bloom passed me one last present, wrapped in a pretty bow. It's what you asked for, he told me. I need to go back. I'm hitting a flight with Ditsy Doo and Lionheart. If I'm going to make it to Tempony Tower in enough time to give the little speech I've prepared, I need to go now. I floated the gaily wrapped box onto my back. Thank you. Who's that for? Calamity asked, trotting up to me as Life Bloom trotted away, swiftly moving to where Ditsy Doo was once again saying goodbye to Silverbell. A few hours should be more than enough for her to get her glow on, 
and she hadn't been about to leave Silverbell's party. It's a gift for Fluffykins, I told him. Calamity sighed. Lil Pip, you know we ain't gonna have time for that. Calamity was right. We each had our targets within Navarro, and we had planned our attack to avoid the barracks. We had to move quickly. No time for sightseeing, but... Just this once, I told him. I want to do right by one of them. Calamity frowned, shaking his orange mane. Little flakes of colour rained out. You ain't gonna be saving her, Lil Pip. You let that master loose, and she'll rip through every pony she sees until they put her down. He pointed at the box. This ain't gonna give her a life back. I know, I confided. But if she's still alive, it's what she'd want. She was a war claw. She wouldn't want her life to end imprisoned and tortured to death. Who would? And when did you start factoring in the wishes of hellhounds into your plans? I looked into Calamity's eyes. When I saw how Autumn Leaf treated them. Well, ouch, he winced. Calamity gritted his teeth. That was a little low. I know he was a mass murdering bastard who needed to be put down, but he was still my brother and a man in his lass. I knew Calamity felt the pain of his brother's death, but the idea that Calamity might be in mourning hadn't really sunk in. I'm sorry, I said regretfully. Well, he replied, accepting the apology. I asked, You've got confetti in your mane, I told him. You do too. Today. Hold it right there, you traitorous Stephen scumbag. We're under attack, and you think it's a good time to pilfer supplies? You're stealing from the Enclave, you worthless shit. No pony steals from the Enclave. Calamity had just finished relatching his saddlebags when the voice tore through the air behind him. Hello, Dad. He turned round to face his father. The drill sergeant froze, staring. Calamity stared back, eyes locked with his father. Then he sighed. You know, I always reckon I'd have loads to say to you if I ever had the chance, he said wearily. But now that I do... I got nothing. The older stallion glared. Calamity? And then he raged. You! You're the one attacking your country! Your own kind! You with that damn dragon! You! Calamity simply shook his head. There are so many things wrong with that. And I don't even know where to start. And you came here, killed ponies. Why? Just to steal? Calamity glanced back at his saddlebag before answering. I came here to save ponies, Dad. And these, they're just a little insurance policy. Something where all my friends better leave here alive if the Enclave ever wants them back. He pushed past his father, heading for the door. Hold it right there, you traitorous piece of filth! The drill sergeant bellowed. Or what? Calamity asked. You ain't gonna shoot me. For all your faults, you ain't Adam Leaf. I'll beat your ass till you wish I had! Calamity looked back at his father, considering this. And no. I'm pretty sure we got nothing but a loud old buck. All bark and no bite. Calamity offered. But feel free to prove me wrong. But I'm betting I'll trounce you. And that will probably lose you whatever respect the troops have left for you. He turned away, walking towards the door. Bad dad. That's it! Calamity's father swooped past him to block the door. You ain't got nothing to say for yourself, you... Yeah. Calamity cut him off before he could find more colourfully derogatory language to spew... And nope. And then with a second thought he added, I'm sorry, Mum, Dad. I'd say something about how badly you dealt with it, but I reckon you already know. My best friend pushed past his father and opened the door. You gotta remain, you know, his father said softly, letting his traitorous son pass. I really liked her mane. Calamity spread his wings and flew away, saying nothing. This morning. So, Buck and Saw, I asked. Feeling ready to ride a dragon? I'm really not comfortable with this, Spike reiterated as he lowered himself down enough for the hellhound sniper to climb onto the makeshift saddle Calamity had cobbled together while I was talking privately to Homage. Within minutes, we were flying over the clouds. Spike had me in one of his hands, and I was floating Velvet and Calamity behind us. My Pegasus friend could fly on his own, but not well enough or fast enough to keep up with a full-grown dragon. The world above the cloud curtain was breathtaking. The air was crisp, fresh and warm in Celestia's light. The sun gleamed off the clouds, a rolling canvas in bright, clean white. 
I felt a little wretched knowing I was bringing war here. As we passed other mountain tops, I spotted one that looked like it had been gutted. All that remained was a gleaming skeleton, like the mountain was a carcass whose bones had been picked clean. I called over to Calamity, pointing it out. That there was stable 98, he informed us. We're men of Pegasus our stables. Most of the ones we did have were built into the mountains. Clouds ain't much protection against mega spells, and the Pegasus have more need for vertical space than most ponies, calling for a different design. The bare exposed remains slipped past us. The enclave stripped all the ones they could find down to the last plate of metal ages ago, he added, and they'd been taking what's left from the frameworks as needed. Several minutes later, we caught sight of a Pegasus city. The stark contrast between those buildings, gorgeous monuments to the past, and the ruins I was used to picking through broke my heart. It was a window back into the beautiful, sunlit past of Equestria as much as any memory orb. But something felt wrong. The city, for all its splendour, was achingly hollow. The ancient, towering buildings and floating rainbow waterfalls dwarfed its scattering habitants in both scale and grandeur. The Pegasus felt like termites in a tree, or like mice carving out their own little mouse holes within a much greater home. It was not the thriving civilization I'd envisioned. Spike lowered into the clouds, the dampness plastering my armour to my coat and matting down my mane. The vision of the preserved world immediately gone, replaced with a haze of grey on white. We would travel the rest of the way obscured by the cloud curtain until we were virtually under the base itself. Ten minutes ago. Brilliant, blazing light erupted across the sunlit skies over Philadelphia. Beams of the purest sunlight, thin as tree trunks, rained down from the crisp blue like white-hot javelins, incinerating everything they touched. The Twilight Society guided the Megaspell's power judiciously. Instead of bringing the Megaspell's full power to bear, destroying the landscape, they wielded it with surgical precision. Celestia I struck down the worst, the most dangerous on both sides. The goal was not to win the battle, but to end it, and to save as many of the innocent and helpless as possible. In the end, the ponies in the ritual chamber decided that they had chosen to do the right thing after all. Not the pleasant thing. Not something, if they had their preference, that they would ever do again. Not something that would make it easy to sleep at night. But the right thing. Right now. My hoof hit the hard red barrier, sparks of energy crackling out from it. The shield felt as solid as a steel wall beneath my hoof. I reared up and slammed my hoof against the shield surrounding the SPP sigil hub once again, and fell on my tail when I rebounded. I wasn't going through. But, but I'd been so sure. I was three-fifths alicorn. More importantly, I had something that no pony who had attempted this had brought. I had a perfect replica of the soul of Rainbow Dash. All of the military mares, actually, right here in my saddlebags. If the bones of Luna hadn't been enough to get through, then the Enclave's goal to use the severed head of Rainbow Dash had been attempted and failed. Then it stood to reason that the shield's bypass was designed to register something much more important than mere genetics. I had to be the one who could get in. I'd been promised this. I had it all worked out. This was my purpose, my destiny. I began to cry. Right now, so many were fighting, probably dying, because they had faith in my plan. Faith in me. How could I be so wrong again? Sunshine and rainbows, she had promised. I heard the sound of explosions and massive energy discharges from the remaining raptors. My crying had become weeping. I put so much, risked so much, and on what? Don't listen to her, the potted plant had insisted. She just wants you to fail. Oh, goddesses, what have I done? Pinkie Pie's voice came back to me. Everything will end in sunshine and rainbows, she announced gleefully. As long as you're willing to face the fire, that is. Face the fire. I looked up the heavens, the bright blue of an endlessly deep sky. What fire? I whimpered. I'd already been through the Everfree Forest. I'd faced Cantalot, the Enclave, and so much more. Haven't I already been through enough? Can't I please just win now? A dark shadow washed over me. As long as you're willing to face the fire. Spike! I shouted, waving my forearms desperately. I need you! 
As the huge purple dragon banked and landed, I wanted to run to him. I wanted to ask him if he trusted Pinkie Pie, trusted her predictions and her advice. But I didn't. It wouldn't matter if he trusted her or not. This wasn't about him. This was my leap of faith. What do you need, little Pip? Spike asked. He looked bad. The raptors had gotten several good strikes on him. His scales were scorched or slags all over his body. He was having a difficult time sitting up straight. Spike had lost several of his scales and was bleeding from the blistered pit where his right eye had been. I walked up to the shield and turned toward the wounded dragon, pressing my body back against the hard field of crackling energy. I need you to breathe on me, I told him flatly. What? Spike roared. Please, just do it, quickly. No, Spike reared back. You'll die. I'm not going to kill you. Please, you have to. No. Oh, goddesses, why are you making me do this? I lied, I told him. What? He looked confused, hurt, and deeply worried in the middle of all of this. I lied about Twilight Sparkle. I confessed, my heart ripping apart. I told him the truth. The whole truth. Every awful, soul-wrenching detail. All! Spike stammered finally, his voice just a whisper. All this time. His face was an apocalyptic storm of emotions. He hated me, and he hated me for making him hate me. In the end, he did the only thing he could do. He roared. I was blinded by the blast of greenish flame. The pain was beyond unbearable. I screamed, and my lungs filled with fire. I could feel my skin bubbling and searing away. I tried to hold on to my most precious memories. My memories of homage. But one by one, those memories burned away like my flesh. Consumed in searing agony until just one was left. The memory of Amarja's last words to me is DJ Pwn3, addressing me across the wasteland. You are my message. Then that too was gone. And everything else. Even the pain. Footnote. Maximum level. And with that, Little Pip is gone. There's still some more to the story though, so don't tune out for the night just yet. Wait for the next chapter for what I think will be the end of the Enclave and the start of a new era. Music time, folks. It- <laughs>